Welcome to the Art of Conscious Living. I'm so very, very pleased today to have and be honored to speak with Temple Brandon. She is a woman who has done so much for the farming, for the humane treatment of animals. She's written a number of books and she is an absolute incredible person who is very grounded in solutions for the planet. She's not talking about it, she is a doer. So, oh, thank, you. thank you and welcome to the show. Good to be here. Sample, you're here in San Francisco and you're at the Eco Festival this weekend and you'll be doing a talk here and a lecture. And what would you be talking about in this? Uh, I'm going to be talking about a variety of different things because I know I'm going to have people there both interested in farming and in autism. And one of the first things I talk about in animal behavior is how to be a good observer. You see, an animal's world is a sensory-based world. They think in pictures, smells, sounds, touch sensations. You know, when I first started my work with cattle, what were the things that the cattle were afraid of? They were afraid of a reflection. They were afraid of going into a place that was too dark. They noticed little things we tended to not notice. And when I first started working on this, people thought it was kind of crazy to look at a reflection. And I found if you get rid of those things that bother the cattle, then they walk right through the facility. So you actually got down on your hands and knees and went and saw it yes, the way I a did. cattle would see yes, it. Yes, I did. And then when I did pigs, I had to get totally down on my hands and knees. The one place I went to, there was reflection on a wet floor, and we just moved the lights over about a few feet, and then the reflection went away, and the pigs ran right up the chute. Also, I always get asked since I work with slaughter plants, do they know they're going to get slaughtered? And I find that they behave the same way at the slaughterhouse as they do going up the veterinary chute. If they knew they were going to get slaughtered, they should be much wilder at the slaughter plant. Temple, what I'd like to speak about with you is that we have the people in the laboratory and in the think tanks, the scientists, and they are all there with their paper and pen and trying to figure out things. But you are very tactile. You actually went there and you, in the way your mind works and who you are, you are about solutions. So well, therefore, find practical solutions. Practical. Also, you got to get out in the field because too much is too much ideology, and they're not thinking about how is it going to work out in the field. You know, the U.S. has got a very diverse climate in different parts of the parts of the, of the U.S. Something that works in one place isn't going to work in drought-stricken Texas, for example. It's real, real variable. You see, I'm a bottom-up thinker, so I like to take specific examples of what works and what doesn't work, and what common denominators are in the things that work, for example. I get asked all the time about education. Well, there's an awful lot of bad stuff going on in education, but there's some schools that really work. Well, let's figure out what's in the schools that really work, but it's specific examples. You see, a bottom-up thinker, and this is the way people with autism think, is you take specific examples to form concepts. So if I was doing schools, I'm going to take specific examples of schools that work. I don't care if they're public, private, I don't care what they are. Schools that work where the kids are going to learn how to read, they learn how to do math, they go out and they get good jobs and they stay out of trouble with the law. Those are schools that work uh, versus schools that, that don't work. So it's specific to general, where the normal person who gets too far away from the practical world, it all becomes ideology and they don't, they don't bother to go look and see what it does down on the ground. It might be doing something bad down on the ground. Right. So what I'm hearing you say is the ide ideology has a place in it, <coughs> but also it's about getting there with the practical and being with the <coughs> solutions and understanding that children, yes, they're going to be thinking about things, but they also, you need to get down on their level and, and see the well, way that the they are is, feeling and thinking. The normal human mind overgeneralizes. There's been very interesting research uh, done on people with autism and people without autism. Mm -hmm. Put them in a brain scanner and have them read out of a book. You put the normal person in there, they just get the, um, uh, they get kind of the syntax just of the general whole. They drop out the details. The autistic person, they get the details. Then you take the person who's got Asperger's, real, real mild autism, they get both the details and the whole. It's, there's a tendency, as people get away from practical things, as our government gets more and more dysfunctional, you're getting more and more people totally removed from the world of, of practical things. Are you familiar with the Waldorf School that really looks at the children well, and I, very I, quickly knows that this child is maybe gifted for music or this one is going to be very well, technical. You, and you, what do you think about the Waldorf School? There are schools that seem to really work. And what kind of and, method uh, would that one be? One of the things is, you take the kids that are kind of different. You've got to 
get them turned on. Like my science teacher saved me. Mm -hmm. he, um, I was not interested in studying until, he got, until I got interested in things like optical illusion rooms and stuff like that. And I spent six months trying to build that optical illusion room. You gotta get kids interested in interesting things, give them a reason to stop. You know, this business of just, um, you know, do endless boring reading drills, how you're gonna just end up labeling the kids oppositional defiant and get them zonked down on 10,000 drugs. That's not the way to do things. Mm. Uh, but what I'm seeing today, and I'm really concerned in this country, we don't make things anymore, is I'm a child of the 50s. The government actually got stuff done in the 50s. We built the interstate highway system. We uh, went to the moon. We did all sorts of things. The best cars. We, we did all kinds of good yes. things. And now, today, it's just fighting. And I think part of the problem is, is that the people that go into government today, they're totally separated from practical stuff. You do practical stuff, sometimes stuff goes wrong. It, it's, um, we've got to get back to more of a, you know, how do we do things? And, and uh, you know, you take an animal agriculture, for example, I mean, I work with everybody. I work with the big guys, I work with the little guys. It's all animal ag. They both have a place in the, in the ag ecosystem. So in the government, do you think like a think tank of, of what to do and well, how to I do it and get down to the level of what is happening well, see, in the you, problem? You tend to be talking in abstractions. Yes. I tend to, being an autistic thinker, and I'm a total visual thinker. If I can't visualize something, I can't do anything with it. When you say think tank, I see a bunch of guys in a conference room in okay. some fancy office building somewhere, you know, far removed, far removed and everything. But what you got to do is look at specific examples of schools that work or certain farming situations that really work. Okay, then you might define what do you mean by it really worked. Um, but my concepts are formed by putting specific examples of things in categories. I know you're doing some very innovative things with the Marin Land Trust, and you've kept you know, dairies and farms going right here outside of San Francisco. I would call that something that works. The Marin Land Trust would be something that would be worth duplicating in some other state. And then I'd use that as a model to make others. You see, it's not abstract. It's practical. It's not it's abstract. It's what is doable. You see, you tend to you see it. People who think more verbally, you tend to over abstractify. And overthink it. I find when parents ask me about a problem with their autistic kid, they'll say, my kid has a behavior problem in the classroom. Or if they ask me about their dog, they say, well, my, my dog growls at people. Well, uh, that's not enough information for me to try to figure out what's wrong. I gotta know, well, who does he growl at? When, where does he do it? Or a behavior issue in the classroom. Is this a four-year-old or is this a teenage boy? You know, is this a verbal person or a nonverbal person? I mean, I gotta know something. I can't even answer the question, a behavior issue in the classroom, without more specific information. Did you want to stop for a moment? We have uh, two more minutes, then we have to wrap it up. Why? That's what they told me. Oh. Well, can we have at least seven minutes? Because, I mean, it's a very all important said, question. All said to be, to be done. Pardon me? All the director of the Fair Marin. Yeah, yeah. He said to wrap it up, like, now. Okay. Oh, how come you had to wrap it up with? I don't know. Paul, the director, they want you to go somewhere, maybe, or something. Yeah, he said to call all right, well, quickly ask me some other questions then. Okay. Um, Temple, I'd like to take you back to when you were a young child. And basically what was happening is the world wanted you to be one way, but you were your way of seeing things in visual, but people didn't understand that. So what was that like? And looking back in hindsight... You're asking something so abstract I almost can't answer it. All right. Um, I mean, I can remember as a young child of frustration of not knowing how to talk. Mm -hmm. And I thought, everybody thought in pictures. I didn't realize that my thinking was different than other people until I wrote my book, Thinking in Pictures. And I wrote Thinking in Pictures in the mid-90s. I updated it, you know, more recently. And I thought everybody thought the way I did until I started interviewing people about how do I think. You know, and I asked people, well, well, think about church steeples. And I was shocked to find out that most people got this vague, generalized church steeple concept picture in their mind. Mm. I just see specific ones. So my concept of what a church steeple is, is I see very specific ones, from the childhood ones to ones in my town. So immediately on your mind's eye screen, I you're seeing... I start to see slides. They come up like a slides, like a series of pictures. 
Wonderful. You see, that's how I think. And now I've been learning more and more how different people think differently. And, and uh, if you think completely in language, you tend to oversimplify things. That's where you tend to fall into something strictly ideological. Yes, I have certain basic principles. You don't steal people's stuff, you know, stuff like that. But I think about that in a very, um, you know, in a very basic way. I mean, I had my car broken into. I'm saying that. That certainly uh, doesn't follow the golden rule. You know, do unto others as they, you know, treat others the way you'd want to be treated. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about when I had my house ransacked and wrecked, a house that I was living in. Uh, somebody broke in and they, they uh, tore the curtains down. And mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. yeah, I was very, very um, upset about that. So what final? So I'm not going to do that to somebody else. Cause Absolutely. Done to me. I didn't like it. Exactly. So treat everybody the way you'd like to be no, treated. I, and uh, the golden rule. Like when you say the golden rule, I see specific examples like that. What do you passionately want to share with others at, at this point in time? How you see America and the world today, with all of the information and how we're being so much overloaded with so much information, as you keep pointing out that people are thinking too much about it instead of actually doing. We need to get back to doing things. I'm really, uh, it really upsets me how they've taken all the hands-on classes out of the schools. You know, they've taken art and mm -hmm. music out of so many schools. You know, wood shop, welding, uh, drawing, all of these kinds of things. I think these things teach practical problem solving skills. They don't test kids in school anymore for visual spatial skills. You know, these are some of the people that can figure out how to build things, how to solve things. So all the hands-on, tactile, practical things. Well, you know, I took us sewing. In the 50s, uh, girls were taught sewing. Uh, in the third grade, I was taught embroidery. I mm -hmm. remember one time wrecking a sewing project because I didn't, uh, you know, I was trying to rush through it. And then you learn not to rush through it. Also, you learn sometimes practical things don't always come out the way you hope they're going to come out. But, they, but these things teach practical problem solving. In my livestock handling class, I have my students actually lay out a handling facility for cattle, and they got to figure out how to do it. And there's different ways you can do it that would all be correct. Would you be open for others to contact you? Because I know there's millions of people that really, really are behind you and what you're doing for the farming animals and so much more that you do. And they could contact you to, to come up with practical ideas well, and solutions. Well, I've got a lot of stuff on my website. I have a website, Brandon.com. It's just my last mm -hmm. name. Brandon.com. Yes. I've got a book called Improving Animal Welfare, A Practical Approach. Improving Animal Welfare, A Practical Approach. If Amazon doesn't have it, then you can buy it from cabby.org. That's C as in Charlie, A, B as in boy, I, dot org in, uh, in the UK. And I'll have a lot of uh, practical uh, farming stuff in that. Um, I also have my animal behavior books, um, Animals in Translation, Animals Make Us Human. Uh, these books have a lot of uh, practical uh, information in them. What do you see yourself doing in the near future? Well, I'm doing a lot of lectures right now, and I've been, I can't, obviously can't go to every lecture I get invited to, but I've been really uh, accepting some of the invitations. I get to talk at the university, talk to young people, get them interested in animal behavior, mm -hmm. get them interested in field work. You know, I don't care whether it's health care or what the problem is. You've got to go find out what's actually happening out in the field. And this is a way for them to connect to themselves and to own their own energy and to empower them. Well, they need to just get out and figure out how to solve problems. I mean, I got that here. I have to give you specific examples. See, I don't think in abstractions. I went to the UK this summer. Yes. In the UK, when they when you know when they get an artificial hip, they can buy the best artificial hip. It costs eighteen thousand dollars for the operation, and it has a ninety-day warranty. You come over here, that same hip, seventy thousand dollars. Are, are you half saying half artificial hip? You know, artificial like, hips. Okay. Artificial hip. Yes. It, artificial hip and installation costs eighteen thousand dollars in the UK, and it costs sixty or seventy thousand dollars here. Half of its liability. Yes. Well, something's wrong here. Uh huh. I mean, when you have that much cost on, on things like that, that's not solving problems. Well, Temple, I would love to speak to you in the future, and perhaps we can uh, speak via Skype. And well, the best thing I can give you, um, I give you one of my cards. Okay. Well, we can do that later, Temple. No, oh, okay. And um, what I'd like to say to you is that I'm very, very honored to meet you, and I feel very, very happy that there's somebody doing 
the actual practical work that you're doing, and not everybody's talking about it. Well, I was just there's too much the, talk, and there's not plant. enough being done. Just two days ago, I was out in a plant. Yeah, you know, so I'm still out there doing stuff. Thank you. And trying to teach other people how to do it. Absolutely, and that's what it's all about. But we've got to find, um, we've got to get away from all just, you know, ideology and fighting each other and, and uh, get back to solving problems. Absolutely. So I'll talk to you in the future. Okay. And thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, great. Thank you for having me. Well, it's really great to really great to be here today. They told me I got to eat the mic, otherwise it's not going to work. And I was just wondering, how many people here is where animals is their main interest? Okay, what about autism as being the main interest? Okay, we've got quite a bit of each then. Kind of like to know, so I kind of know how to do my remarks. I think I'll start out and just uh, talk a little bit about what autism is. It's a developmental disorder that can vary from an individual that's going to remain nonverbal all the way up to half the people that work in Silicon Valley. <laughs> because if you take a few of the social circuits out, then you got geek circuits to figure out all kinds of really, really cool stuff. And I just saw a t-shirt over there of some big computer show and it says something like Geek Fest. And I go, yep, I can really, really get into that. <laughs> now, another question I constantly get asked all the time is how would autism help me in my work with animals? Well, I'm a visual thinker. I think completely in pictures. If I don't think in pictures, I don't think. And the HBO movie did an absolutely fantastic job of showing how my visual thinking works. Like they said, shoe, and a bunch of different shoe pictures just came right up. See, the thing is, my thinking is specific. I used to think that everybody thought in pictures. And then when I wrote Thinking in Pictures, which instantly is on the book stand, I was shocked to find out in the, the mid-90s that most people, if I said to think about a church steeple or maybe think about a highway overpass, they get a generalized generic one. I see only specific ones. Now, I think most people here in San Francisco, if I said bridge, they're going to see a specific one. Uh, so I don't think I would use uh, that. But the thing that shocked me was that other people had these vague, generalized, kind of tower-like things. It was just all very vague in general. See, and up until that time, I thought everybody, I thought everybody thought in pictures. I didn't know my thinking was different. So some of the very first work I did with cattle, I got down in the chutes to see what are the animals seeing? because I noticed in one cattle handling facility, the animals would go right through the facility. And in another cattle handling facility, they wouldn't. And it would be something simple like orientation to the sun. If the sun was blinding the cattle, they wouldn't go in. If there was a shadow or the chute entrance was too dark, they wouldn't go in. Another thing that I had to answer for myself very early on, since I was been working with the slaughter plants is, do the cattle know they're gonna get slaughtered? And I found that they behaved the same way in both places. And in the movie, they had to change the name of the Swift plant in Arizona to, the, to Abbott because Swift is still a brand name that still exists. So it's too much, too much trouble to get the rights on it. So they just changed it into Abbott. And so at Abbott, I found that the cattle behaved the same way as they did in the feed yard. And a lot of that excitement and agitation you might see at a slaughter plant is due to just being novel. You know, sometimes you get a steer that gets berserk at the county fair and runs through the midway. Well, the reason why that happens is because at the county fair, there's lots of new stuff there the steer's never seen before, like flags, bikes, and balloons. Well, you want to get your steer accustomed to those things before he goes to the fair. You see, that is reaction to novelty. Now, the thing is, with animals, if you want to understand them, you've got to get away from from language. You totally have to get away from language because if you stay thinking in language, you're not going to understand animals. Think about what he's seeing. What's your dog looking at? What's your dog hearing? What is he smelling when he's checking out the local tree? He knows who's been there 
when they were there, are they a friend or foe? There's lots and lots and lots of information on the local tree. It's very detailed, sensory-based information. Now, one of the things that being a sensory-based thinker does to you is the way that you form concepts is different. It's what's called bottom-up thinking. So if I want to teach a dog how to sit, I got to do it in many different places. If I only taught him how to sit in the living room, he might think that sitting only applies to the living room. He's got to learn he's got to do it in the house. He's got to do it outside. He's got to do it at the dog park. He's got to do it along the river here. He's got to do it in a lot of different places. So, you know, what I'm seeing now, one thing that um, Thinking in Pictures does for me is everything is specific. You know, when people try to troubleshoot a problem with an animal or a problem with their autistic kid or a problem with anything, they'll say something vague like, how do I handle behavior issues in the classroom? I don't know how to answer that question. Is a kid three years old? Is a kid in high school and he just uh, beat the teacher up? Is it a two-year-old having a tantrum? I mean, how you would deal with these things is different. Is it because he fidgets? You know, I've got to have a lot more information. And there was a very, very interesting experiment done at the University of Pittsburgh that showed how the normal mind tends to drop out details. So they took an Asperger person, that's mild autism, they took a fully autistic person where there's been speech delay, and they took a um, regular person and put them in the functional MRI scanner that measures activity in the brain, and they had them read out of a book. Now the autistic person just gets the detail of the words. The Asperger gets both the syntax, the overall whole, and the detail of the words. But guess what happens to the normal person? They drop out the detail. Well, this is the thing I always find a problem. People try to overgeneralize. Not a good thing. Now, the problem with bottom-up thinking is that to get very good at forming concepts, because concepts are formed by specific examples, I've got to experience a lot of different things. It's very important to get kids with autism out doing lots of different things, experiencing lots of stuff. Another thing you've got to do with them is you've got to teach them stuff like turn-taking. You've got to teach them things like manners. Oh, you know, always um, you know, be teaching them. And if they do something wrong, don't scream at them. Just say, well, you should have shook Mrs. Jones's hand in that situation. Or if the kid runs behind the counter, you might say, well, only the uh, store staff can go behind the counter. Don't scream no, just give the instruction. Now, to be a bottom-up thinker, okay, to learn about designing cattle handling facilities, what I did is I went to every feed yard in Arizona and I worked cattle. Then I began to see what worked in some facilities and what did not work in some facilities. Bottom-up thinking is putting the pieces together. It's sort of like if I got this great big huge jigsaw puzzle and I had no idea what the picture on the puzzle was because I, did, I don't have the box anymore. I just have the puzzle. And I put it together and I might get it a third of the way together and then I realized maybe it's got a picture of a horse on it. That's, sorry, that water bottle just splashed right up in my face. That's, um, that is bottom-up thinking. Everything that you teach an animal or you teach an autistic kid, you gotta, it's done by specific example. And if you want the dog to generalize, uh, teach them in many different places. But there's some things where you can get one trial learning, especially if it's something really, really scary. Like in my book, Animals in Translation, I wrote about a horse that was afraid of black cowboy hats because during a veterinary procedure, somebody had thrown alcohol in his eyes and that person was wearing a black cowboy hat. So white cowboy hats and white hats were good, black hats were bad. Or you could have a horse that was abused in one particular type of bit. So any bit that feels anything like that bad bit, that's maybe a jointed bit, the horse is going to be afraid of it and some other kind of bit, he'll be fine. See, animal thinking, since it's sensory based, it's very specific, but it can generalize in kind of a specific way. Like, for example, guys with beards are bad. There was an elephant that was terrified of diesel powered equipment. If it ran with a diesel engine, it was bad. If it ran with a gasoline engine, it was good because somebody had probably abused the elephant with a diesel powered uh, construction equipment. 
And so he associated the sound of a diesel engine, which makes a characteristic sound, with it's different than the sound of a gas engine. See, what I want to try to get you to do is to enter a sensory world. Then you'll start to understand animal behavior. Now, I have found in, you know, working with people with autism, that there's different kinds of thinking. When I wrote some of my very first stuff, I thought that everybody on the spectrum thought in pictures. And then somebody wrote a review on Amazon.com, and they said, well, that just simply isn't true. And so when I did a revision of thinking in pictures in 2006, I put in my observations on some other kinds of thinking. But one of the things that's the same, and everybody that has autism, is they tend to be good at one thing, bad at something else. Very, very specialized skills. I'm a photorealistic visual thinker. Absolutely can't do algebra. There's a ton of kids that can't do algebra that need to jump to geometry and trig. And unfortunately, I never got a chance to go to geometry and trig. That was a gigantic mistake in my math education. Another kind of mind, and this is the computer programmer mind, is the pattern thinker. They think in patterns, like think mathematical patterns, think origami, think organic chemistry molecules, think geodesic domes. That's thinking in patterns. This is the kid that when he's in third or fourth grade may need to have a high school math book, but he needs to be, have special ed in reading. You know, and don't make this kid do baby math over and over again because then they'll end up just labeling them oppositional defiant. And I'm really kind of appalled at how um, they're just putting, giving kids all these labels and getting way too many kids on way too many medications. Now, I take medication, take antidepressants, very, very low dose of it, and that works really well for anxiety. And anybody who's interested in reading... Um, uh, stuff about that, the thinking in pictures, I write about that. Also in another autism book called The Way I See It, second edition, is information on uh, medication. I don't really want to get into that now, but those two books recommend reading. Okay, let's get back to the third kind of thinker. That's the word thinker. This is the kid that loves history. His favorite thing might be naming all the presidents. And these kids are not visual thinkers. Math skills usually about average. So you have different kinds of specialist minds. And we need to be thinking about what can this kid do when they grow up? Another thing we've got to be doing with a lot of these kids is kind of stretching them a bit more. You know, I'm seeing too many smart kids where they haven't learned basic skills, like how to shop, how to do the most basic stuff. And so one of my big things that I've been talking about is job skills. When I was 13 years old, Mother got me doing a little sewing job. When I was 15 years old, I went out to my aunt's ranch. And at first, I was afraid to go. My mother says, well, I think you can handle it for about a week. Well, after about a week, um, I ended up um, wanting to stay there. And I really did build the gate that you could open up from the car. When I was in college, I did internships. You know, we got to start thinking in middle school, what are kids going to do when they grow up? And I'm really appalled and how the educational system now is taking out so many of the hands-on classes. You know, things like art, music, woodworking, welding, drafting. Well, there's a lot of uh, jobs out there for, let's say, for welding right now. There's a lot of jobs for certified welders. There's a shortage of things like plumbers and electricians. There's a lot of, um, you know, things out there. The other thing you got to do with kids is you got to show them interesting stuff. You know, I got all fixated on that optical illusion room. And I really did spend six months figuring out how to build that. You want to get kids fixated on that kind of stuff. Now, autism is a very important part of who I am. But autism is secondary to my career working with livestock. I'm seeing too many kids come up to me and they want to just talk about autism. No, I'd rather talk about medieval knights talk about um, their interest in science, or they like to do computer programming, or something like that. You know, I'd like to talk about those kind of things. Because the thing is, I come out here, Silicon Valley, half the people there have Asperger's. <laughs> then I go back to Kansas, or I go down to the southeastern United States, and the kids are getting addicted to video games, and they're going nowhere. You know, they weren't, they're the same guy, it's the same geek. This is what makes me kind of nuts. Now, a question I often get asked 
is since there's been a lot of bad things going on in the livestock industry, how did, how did I manage to stay in it so long? Well, when I started out in the 70s, I started out in Arizona, and they had big feedlots out there, but they stayed really dry, six inches of rain a year, and they had shade. All the cattle had shade. So the living conditions were good. Handling was terrible. But I could see handling as something that I could fix. You know, if I had been first exposed to cattle, you know, two foot deep in mud, maybe my career would have gone another way. But I wasn't. You know, it was lucky that I was raised in, in Arizona. And then there were people in the industry that even back in the bad old days that did a good job. There were meat plants that did a good job. There weren't very many of them back then that did a good job, but there were some. There was an excellent um, Singing Valley Ranch in Arizona, Bill and Penny Porter. Um, they were very much involved in my cattle formative years, and they handled their Hereford cattle absolutely beautifully. Those cattle had a really good life that was worth living. So I knew that animal ag could be done right. Now in the last 10 years, there's been a lot of improvements in the big slaughter plants. Like I got asked by one of the members of the press, well, aren't you just helping them to slaughter more animals? I'll tell you right now, the plants are the same size now as they were in the late 80s. These big plants, they, they handle the same amount of cattle per hour now as they did 20 years ago. That hasn't changed. And one of the really important things you've got to change is you've got to change the management. When I first started out, I thought I could fix everything with engineering. In the 70s, I thought if I could just build the right system, everything would work fine. Uh-uh. You've got to have the management to go along with it. So I got a lot of systems in. Half of the cattle in the U.S. are handled in equipment I designed. But people weren't managing it right. Oh, there were a few that managed it right. And then in 1999, I was hired by McDonald's and Wendy's Corporation to implement their animal welfare system. And I came up with a very, very simple way to score animal welfare using outcome variables, like how many cattle fell down during handling, how many cattle were mooing and bellowing their heads off in the slaughter chute, how many cattle did you poke with the electric prod, how many cattle did you shoot correctly on the first shot and put them down with one shot. That stuff I could measure. And when we first started, it was terrible. Only 30% of the plants could shoot 95% of the cattle with a single shot. This is back in 1996. Okay, why was it so bad? They simply did not maintain their equipment. That was management. And then I um, worked with the McDonald's auditors, training them how to do the really simple scoring system, kicked a few plants off the approved supplier list, and there's been a lot of changes. Things are, there's still problems. And then maybe, um, you know, mid-2000s, then I got really big into working on some of these little plants. We were actually in kind of the weird situation where maybe around 2005, the big plants were better than some of the little plants. The thing I have found about the little tiny slaughter plants, they're either really good or they're really awful because they're so dependent on the personality of the owner. And then some little plants just don't know how to do things right. My, one of my students um, did a study where we figured out very simple ways to improve stunning of pigs. The good news is, is that most of the things to make a slaughter plant have good animal welfare don't cost a lot of money. Out of 75 plants on the original McDonald's and Wendy's supplier list, only three had to build really expensive things. The other ones we fixed with a lot of simple things. Non-slip flooring. Oh, we put a lot of non-slip flooring in. Uh, lighting up a chute that was too dark. Cattle are afraid of the dark. Putting up a piece of uh, metal so the animals didn't see a vehicle going by. Put up a conveyor belt curtain so they didn't see people walking by. Block up a hole in the roof where a sunbeam came in. Just very, very simple things like that. We were able to fix most of the plants. Plus lots of training and lots of supervision. Now, the Cargill Corporation now has put in um, video auditing, where auditors over the internet watch over stunning, they watch over truck unloading, they watch the cattle coming up the chute, and that solves the problem of people acting good when people are out there with clipboards and seeing what's going on. So there's been a lot of things that improve. There's still problems. There's still an occasional plant that does something really stupid, really, really stupid and bad. Some of that's still going on. But the industry as a whole has improved a whole lot. Another thing that's been a problem is sort of the warfare between big ag and little ag. 
I'm so sick and tired of that kind of warfare because both animal agriculture, I'll work with both. And uh, I think, you know, a lot of the kind of things you're doing here may become 25% of the market. But then you go out into the low income areas of the United States, I mean, they're going to have to have affordable eggs. And there's things that need to be improved in big ag. And one of the things I've said to big ag is you need to open up the door electronically. There are a few places that have done that. JS West, that's a, a, a chicken place that, um, you know, for eggs. Uh, has a, it is a caging system, but it's a better caging system where the birds have a private nest box. They've got perches. These are things that the birds want. And you can go on the JS West website and you can look at the live hen cam. Fair Oaks Dairy in Illinois has put in a camera where you can watch cows calving. And I've got videos up on YouTube. Just type in Temple Grandin cattle, Temple Grandin pigs into YouTube, and I've got videos showing my slaughter stuff. Now, there's some people in the industry that want to call it harvest facility. That's a bunch of BS. That is just BS. And they don't, some people in the industry don't like it when I use the S word. And I said, well, I went out to Hollywood and I used the slaughter word in a big Hollywood press conference. You know, well, that's harvesting. We do that with grain, not with cattle and pigs. This is ridiculous. <laughs> and we need to be just showing what we do. I've taken a lot of people through the big plants they got in Colorado and the kind of support. and then words narrate the pictures. And one of the problems I have is the organization. So the book's divided up into chapters, and my editor, Betsy, uh, uh, pulled her hair out organizing some of my stuff and making out things where I repeated myself. What I have found in writing is I've got to um, make a really, really tight outline uh, to keep from rambling around. Scientific papers, I have no problems. I got lots of stuff on Grandin.com that's all my writing unedited. Animals in Translation. Incredible. Well, animals in translation. What does this mean, animals in translation? Well, sort of talking about understanding animal behavior. And in that, I talk about how autism is helpful to me in animal behavior because as I think in pictures, that's more closely to how an animal would think. An animal is a sensory based thinker. They think in pictures, they think in sounds, they think in touch sensations. It's sensory based, it's not word based, which makes it much more detail based. So where does the macro come in? When you're detailed, do you see the macro at the same time? Uh, no, well, see, my, I form a big picture by putting together the puzzle pieces. Let's imagine uh, someone gave you a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle in a paper bag. You got no idea what the picture on the box is because the box is gone. Now I start to put it together, maybe have it a third of the way together, I might have a pretty good idea that a horse is the picture on the box and not, not a house or a person or something else. It's putting the pieces together. Now the thing about bottom up thinking is in order to see a picture, I gotta read a lot of stuff to get a lot of pieces together. You know, I've now at the um, age of my early 60s, I've read enough stuff where some of the big issues in the country that I'm starting, I, I see things that we need to do. The problem that you have with top-down thinking, which is more verbal, is people tend to oversimplify. Right. Tend to get a single ideology and then try to cram everything into it. It's right. not gonna work. 